Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College, and today we're going to start a new series on design patterns for game code. We're going to go over a bunch of different patterns that you can use in your projects, and I'll be covering these probably a couple of weeks for the next few weeks. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, make sure that you're subscribed and just check back regularly. So we're going to start with the command pattern. The command pattern is essentially a way of using objects to tell other things what to do. So you can kind of read the description here. It says it's a behavioral design pattern in which an object is used to encapsulate all the information needed to perform an action or trigger an event at a later time. This could actually be at the same time as well. In fact, in our demo, it will be. And it says it includes the method name, the object that owns the method values, and the method parameters. So don't worry too much about the Wikipedia description here. It's actually really long, goes into a lot of detail. But we're just going to dive into a Unity example, and then we'll go into a more complex example after that. So let's just close this down, and I'm going to begin with this very, very basic scene here. So we've got a camera, a light, and a cube. My cube has three scripts on it, and I want to show you what it does, and then I'm going to show you how we use the command pattern to make it do what it's doing. And then, as you can see previewed right here, later on we'll go into a more RTS or MOBA style command pattern system. So let's hit play, and I've got this set up now so that I can use the arrows to move this cube around, just using arrow keys on my keyboard. I can use Q to scale it up, move it around, use A to scale it down, and relatively boring stuff. But what I can do now is just hold backspace and watch as it goes back and undoes everything that I've just done. So all that movement, here let's do it again and move around a little bit, hold backspace, watch it walk back and I can even move over here maybe scale it up move over here scale it down and then backspace a little bit and then totally change what I've done move it around again now I'm going forward and then hold backspace again and you see we can still kind of go back and undo now backspace is just the key that I happened to bind to undo on these commands but I think it's time to dive into the code and show how everything works so let's open up well, let's see, let's start with our entity script. So our entity script is a mono behavior that implements this iEntity interface. And I'm just gonna go to that real quick and show you what it looks like. Hold down control and click on it to go right to it. Here you see that we just have a transform and then a method called move from to. And we're not actually using this in this example. We're only using the transform part. So let's see why, well, I guess I'll, I'll show you why we're using this interface in a little while. It's essentially because I got two demos here and I like to keep everything behind an interface. So in awake, we've got our input reader getting cached here. We'll look at that class in just a moment. And a command processor class getting cached. And we also have the require component attribute on here just so that they're automatically added when I added the entity. And because, well, really it requires these to work. Then in our update, we are checking for a direction from our input reader. So we just call input reader dot read input. And this is returning back a vector three. We check to see if it's not zero. So if we got any movement direction at all, we're going to do something. And what we're going to do is create a new move command. We're going to pass in this entity as the first parameter and then the direction that we're moving as the second parameter. And then we just tell our command processor to execute that command. So this is essentially, let's see, let's comment out all of this stuff real quick and just show that this is essentially what we need for the movement part. So if I jump back over here and hit play, I'll be able to move, I just won't be able to undo or scale. Here, let's try it. So get in here and I can still move around. Undo doesn't work, scaling doesn't work, just as expected. So let's first take a look at this read input method because I think it's important to see what this is doing and know where all the data is coming from. So we go into here and you see it's very, very simple, relatively ugly code actually. We're just looking to see if it's left arrow, we get a negative one X, right arrow, we get a one for the X, and then same for up and down, we just set the Y value. And then we return back a new vector three with the X and the Y, if one of them is not zero. Otherwise we just return back vector three dot zero. Really nothing exciting here. We also have a read undo, which just returns back whether or not I'm hitting backspace and a read scale, which returns one for Q, so that's when I'm scaling up, and a negative one for A when I'm scaling down. It should probably be a direction enum or something, but it works fine the way it is. 
And like I said, this is a very simple little ugly input reader class. Well, let's go back to the entity. So we're getting the direction, we're creating a move command, and we're passing in this and the direction. Let's see what that looks like. So our move command, you see, has two parameters in the constructor, the entity, using that I entity interface, and the direction. And here we're passing the entity into this base class. And we'll take a look at that in one second. But the other thing that we do is we cache the direction that's created here. So when we create our move command, we give it the direction that this thing is going to move. And we store it in this vector 3. Then when we execute, you can see it's actually extremely simple. Our execute call is just telling our entity, which you'll see is cached in a moment, to move its position in the direction times 0 0.01. Very, very simple. Let's go back to that entity one more time. And that's right here. So when this command processor executes the command, it's actually calling through and telling that to execute. But let's dive more into the command structure itself. So here we have our move command, and this inherits from this base command class. And in this base command class, you see we just have the entity as a protected variable because our other commands are going to want access to this entity. And two abstract methods for execute and undo. And this is also an abstract class, which just means we can't instantiate a new command. It has to be a subclass of command, like our move command or our move to command. And you'll see we actually have quite a few different commands. We'll be going over those very shortly. So let's take a look again at this update. So remember, we read the direction, we check to see if the direction's not zero, then we create a move command, and then I said that we execute it, but we're not actually just saying move command dot execute. It's not something like move command, like if we just did this, it'd be extremely simple. It'd call that, it'd move that, it'd almost feel kind of pointless, because what the hell is the point of creating this command? just move this thing right over and not do anything with it afterwards. So we don't do that. Instead, we have this command processor class. And this has the execute command and takes in a command. So let's take a look at that. We hit F12 to go right to it. Our command processor just has a list of commands. And then it has the current command index, which is just the command that was most recently run. So in our execute command method, we add our current command that we're passing in to this commands list right here. So this gets added in, then we execute it immediately, and then we set the command index to essentially the end of this command list. Now the command index and list don't necessarily have to be that. We could use an array, we could use some queues, we could use any different type of data structure. The main point is that we're keeping commands in here and we're storing them so that we can have some undo history and be able to undo them, or even be able to replay them later. So if we have all of these commands stored off in this processor, if we want, we could always write these commands out to disk, maybe reload and replay all of our actions, kind of like you'd see in um, a lot of online games that just support replays. It's exactly how they do it. Although they, of course, use a much more advanced system than this little demo, but they go through the same process. So let's see, we com execute command, again, we add it, we execute it, and we set the index. Then in our undo method, we actually let check here to make sure that we have a command in here, which essentially could be the same as checking to see if commands.length is greater than zero. Um, then we undo the command. So we get the command at that current index and we call undo on it. And then we remove it and decrement that index. So how does that work? Let's take a quick look. Let's go back to our move command. If you look at our undo method, so if we're undoing this, we're actually doing the same exact thing, just in reverse. And that's generally how commands work. If it was a take damage command, it would, on the undo, re restore that health. Um, if it's a move command, it would undo that and you know, undo the move, just like we're doing here. Uh, same for like a buy command or whatever the different command is. The undo is essentially doing the opposite. Now, you need to be able to support doing the opposite on these things. So if your death, you know, your death situation or your death script for your entities destroys them, you may not be able to just undo that. So you got to think this through if you want to use this pattern and be able to actually do the undos of everything. So let's go back into our entity one more time and just uncomment out these two parts. So again, here we're reading undo, which is just check for backspace. And if it's true, we undo that command. And then here we're doing a different command. 
So we read the direction from that read scale. Remember, this is a negative one or a positive one based on if I hit Q or A. And then I'm executing a new command that's a scale command. And here again, I'm passing in the entity as the first parameter. But then here I pass in the scale direction as the second one. Let's take a look at that. So we go in, you see this is again, a very simple class. And that's one of the nice things about this pattern is that you'll end up with a bunch of little commands that do all of their work kind of inside them. And they're nice and small and easy to read and easy to understand. So here we cache the scale factor. Let me get rid of that too. We don't need that. And then in execute, we scale it by the scale factor. And the scale factor is either going to be 1.1 or 0 0.9 based on this direction. And these are just some hard-coded values. We could always adjust this or make this configurable somewhere else. But I think this worked great for demonstrating. And then in undo, we just divide by that scale factor. So just do the opposite or the inverse to undo our actions. So that's a pretty cool, basic little system for moving things around. It does have some issues though. The biggest one being that we are allocating memory every time that we create a command here. And we're doing this in the update, so we're allocating not a lot of memory, but we're allocating, I think it's about 40 bytes every frame that we're moving. So if we're not gonna use this data, not really useful to, to hold on to it, but if we wanna have some undo history, this can be extremely useful. Now, I think in a lot of cases, for depending on the game type, you may want this to be a pooled set of commands so that we're just kind of pulling from a list and not allocating new commands all the time, especially if we're on a mobile system. We don't want to be generating a bunch of garbage. Um, if we're never getting rid of these, though, then it's not really garbage collection. We're ne never deleting them. Um, but let's just go on to the next demo. So the other demo that I wanted to show was with a more click to move MOBA style, RTS style game. So here we've just got a little dude and I can hit play. And here we're gonna generate a lot less commands. Cause what we're gonna do is generate a command whenever I click. So I click here, generated a command to move there, click there, another command, and I'll go over there, it's another command. Now if I hit backspace, all of these commands will execute in reverse order each time I hit it. Again, this could be a replay or a time rewind or something else. But backspace is a nice simple one for me to hit here. So how is this different and how is it working differently? Let's take a quick look. So if we go into our scripts, oh, here, first let's just select it. It's actually this cube with just this tune RTS guy on it. And then if we take a look at the scripts here, you see we have a click to move entity, a little bit different. We have a click input reader, which is again, a different script. And then we have this same command processor script because that really doesn't need to change. So let's open these up and see how this is acting. So in our click to move entity, we still implement that I entity interface, but we're doing things a little bit differently. Here in our update, we're getting a click position from this click input reader. I'm just gonna go right into it and show. It's a very, very simple script. Returns a nullable vector three. We look for our mouse down, so our left click. If we left clicked, we do a raycast using camera dot main dot screen point to ray with the mouse position it's just going to ray cast right into the scene and find the thing that we clicked on theoretically and technically it's actually even going to find the cube or the guy that we click on we're not even ray or masking to just the ground so anything that we click on will return a position otherwise we'll get back no and i don't need to go to the scale command where are we going let's go back to our click to move entity so here we get the position. If the position is not null, so basically if I clicked anywhere and the raycast hit something, then we're calling in execute command and passing in a new move to command. It's a little bit different than that move command. And I'll show you that in just a second. But first, let's take a real quick look here. And I've actually shortcutted instead of going into the input reader, just checking to see if we hit backspace. And if we do, we're calling undo. So we just undo whatever the last one was. So let's go into the move to command. Here, you see that we cache the destination. We also have a field here for our original position. And if you look at our execute method, when we call execute, we cache the position of the thing when this method executes. That's so that when we undo, we can go right back to that position. And then we call entity.movefrom2. And we pass in the original position and the destination. And then in our undo, we do the exact opposite. We call entity.movefrom2 
and we pass in the current position and then the original position because we're going to go backwards. And this method is actually another very simple one. Let's go right to it. Oops, that's the interface de definition. Let's go to the actual implementation, which is in our click to move entity. And here you'll see that all I'm doing, again, this is not an ideal solution for this. Just wanted a real quick, simple way to move things. Um, we start a coroutine right here called move from to async, pass in the positions, the start and the end. And then we count from zero to one, essentially, and lerp across from our start position to our end position. So we're moving our guy from the start to the end at whatever percent that is. So when we start off, it's at zero, starts at this start position, this beginning one. And then when we've reached one, basically when elapsed is up to one, we're 100% of the way across to end position. And then at the end, it just set it to make sure that if we had any rounding problems or anything, we go directly to that end position, that last frame. So not nothing too complicated there, but it does give us a really nice effect where we can, again, click around. I can even interrupt my clicks because we're storing those positions and then hit backspace and go back and undo them all. Hit go back, back. Oh, whoops, I've lost them all. There we go. I move it around and then I go back, 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 back back and back and I think you kind of get the idea so this is like I said a relatively simple implementation of the command pattern or two relatively simple implementations it's a very good pattern for RTS style games uh, turn-based games are great I thought about doing a turn-based demo for this too because you th think about it a little bit more you can batch up all of these commands and you don't necessarily have to execute them all at once you could have the player select multiple units queue up commands for them and then when they end their turn you run all of those commands sequentially right? so think about like a civilization game or something like that where you queued up a bunch of actions you end and then all of your actions happen right? you can do that you can also swap in an ai relatively easily to control this the ai just needs to send commands to this entity's command processor and we're good it'll work exactly the same as the player doing it in fact ideally we'd probably separate off all of that control stuff away from the entity itself and have a player input system that's then passing on messages to whatever entity it's controlling anyway i hope this is kind of helpful and shows how you can use a command pattern and one of the biggest benefits of course is that undo functionality and redo functionality it's pretty cool too i thought about showing that but Seemed a little bit overkill. It's also really good for replays and just for bigger online games. Right? If you have a, an online game where you're doing things like you know clicking and moving a unit, it's a whole lot easier to do that with commands because then you pass in a command, every client can run that command and execute it and keep in step. So again, hope this is helpful. If you like this design pattern and want to know more about it, I can definitely do more demonstrations later can show some other examples of how you use this um, and then again if you're interested in design patterns in general i'll be doing a bunch more videos on them in the next coming weeks so don't forget to check them out also there's a great book on game design patterns that's linked down in the description i definitely recommend going to check it out and grabbing a copy for yourself all right thanks for watching don't forget to like subscribe share with your friends bye